great time of prayer and manifestations. Um, you guys ready to get into the word together? Let's make it happen. Um, Mindy, I thought it was interesting that you read from James 1. That's what uh, Jerry and I translated this afternoon. So that was, uh, yeah, in fact, we may, we may end up there tonight just a little bit. There's some really great stuff in, uh, in James chapter 1. Well, last Thursday, Jeff taught on Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And he did a really good job. Sean and I got to listen to that uh, as we were driving. And I want to go back and pick up some details and see if we can go a little deeper into some of the stuff that is there in the Ephesians chapter 2. Um, can you guys hear me okay? All right, we're going we're gonna to start right in verse 1. Um, and when we, as we start in verse 1, there's kind of a translator's conundrum here because the, the, the Greeks got very used to long sentences and the subject of the sentence being moved to the end of the sentence because a Greek is an inflected language and you can tell from the, uh, from the noun itself whether it's a subject or an object or the object of a preposition, that kind of thing. And uh, so you, so they got used to really long sentences. And when you look at Ephesians chapter two, verse verses one to seven, those seven verses in Ephesians chapter two are one sentence. And the the subject of the sentence uh, really, honestly, uh, isn't even until verse five when it says, "Made us alive together." That's, that's really, or I guess I, you would say that would be the verb that would make sense of the sentence in English. And that's why we supplied that verb at the very beginning of uh, verse 1, where it says, and you, he made alive, which you notice is in italics in the REV when you were dead. So in you, he made alive when you were dead. Um, but it's always a translator's conundrum, because it does make the English easier to understand to, to copy that verb, if you will, out of verse 5 and put it in verse 1 where it would have been in English so that we can read it and read it comfortably. But if we back up a second and say, well, why didn't God put it there to begin with? <laughs> then, then we've got a question to answer. And what we find out is that in these first seven verses that make up this sentence in Ephesians chapter 2, there's really three parts to this long sentence. And the first part is how horrible we were <laughs> and, and the need that we had. And the second part is how great God is and the love that he has. And the third part is the wonderful things that God has done for us. And this is all packed into one long sentence. And so many times as, as just human beings, uh, we don't appreciate what we have until we lose it. And so learning what we don't have is an important part, or what we, what we didn't have, if you will, is an important part of appreciating what we have now. And that's where Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3 are going. Basically, what they're doing is they're, they're showing us where we were. And so chapter 2, verse 1 would really start out like this, be more like, and you, and then there'd be a pause, you know, and you. So we point our fingers at ourselves. When you were dead due to your transgressions and sins, in which you once walked according to the ways of the world. And it goes on about how horrible we were and what we didn't have. <laughs> and so it's it's worth, um, you know, and then it's going to go on to what, how great God was and he made us alive and stuff like that. But what we should grab hold of is the, the first part of this. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1, verse 2, 
is, is really talking about the bad state that we were in and how we did not deserve, we certainly didn't deserve everlasting life. We didn't deserve God's love. We didn't deserve all the great things he did for us, which is why, as in verse four, that God had to be rich in mercy. Not, not just, God just didn't have mercy. He was rich in mercy, and, and we really get that. And so let's uh, see if we can pick this apart just a little bit. Uh, verse 1, and you. So again, in the Greek, the way this would start with the punch on you, you know, make sure you're including yourself. It isn't like some of us were, were almost good enough to be saved. <laughs> you know, we just weren't. <laughs> and it says, when you were dead. Um, this is this is a tough first to tr a tough word to translate not because the word dead is difficult it's not uh, but because the concept is difficult when it's in fact uh, part of the problem that we run into with people who are in the world and you run into them every day and they don't think they need salvation and they don't think they need God and why do they why don't they think they need salvation? Why don't they think they need God? Because they're not dead. <laughs> if, if they were actually dead, and if dead people could talk, they'd say, help, I'm dead. Can somebody make me alive? But, you know, but they're, but they're walking around. They got cars. They got houses. They got food. They're not dead. And so they don't think they need help. And so the word dead here has two points of emphasis. The first is actually just like seated in Ephesians 2.6, it's a prophetic perfect, uh, or as some of the scholars say, it's proleptic. It's actually, um, it's not real now, but it's prophetic of what it will be. Um, you, could, you could translate, you could almost translate this idiomatically, and you, when you were going to be dead because that's what will happen if you don't get saved. You're, you're going to be dead. But the, the reason for just translating it dead here, uh, first of all, you've already got the prophetic perfect in verse 6, but also there is a sense in which we were spiritually dead. So physically, we were on a course to be dead. We were going to be dead. But spiritually, we were dead. There was no spiritual life in us. We were just body and soul. I mean, gosh, we sometimes we seem weak enough as body, soul, and spirit. But man, body and soul, it was just a mess. So, and 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 you, each one of us, when you were dead, you were you were going to die, and you were spiritually dead. And why? And it's due to transgressions and sins. And transgressions and sins is a, a kind of a, a little mini lesson in the Word of God, if you will, because uh, transgressions, the Greek word paraptoma, refers to when there's, a, when there's actually a law and you break it. Uh, and, and that's a transgression. You transgress the law. But a sin is a, a sin... Um, in a more amorphous sense, if you will. Um, if you remember, even in Romans, the early chapters of Romans, it says that even before the law, there was sin in the world. Why? Because there, there doesn't have to be a law for there to be sin. I'll give you a perfect example. You come up to a four-way stop, but there's no stop signs. Does that mean that Everybody can go charging through the, through the intersection without looking or without stopping. No, you're going to get hurt or you're going to hurt somebody else. There's a, there's a moral imperative. God has created us in his image. And according to Genesis chapter 3, we know good from evil. And there doesn't have to be a law written down that we, can, that we transgress but we know good from evil. And that's why sometimes when we do something that isn't exact, it's not really breaking the law, but it's just kind of, we just know it's not good, then our conscience bothers us. And so what God is doing here 
when he said, you know, you were going to die. You know, there's, there was no salvation for us. We were going to die. Why? Well, we, we broke God's commands, but beyond that, we broke God's moral imperative. We, we were immoral in our lives. We made really bad decisions. And, and that's part of becoming a good Christian, is, is not being a Pharisee and tithing of mint and anise and all the little things of the law. and walking according to the moral in imperative. You know, if, um, you know, a good example would be in sharing our faith. You know, if God commands you, go share your faith with that guy, and then you don't do it, you're transgressing. But frankly, if you know somebody needs help, and the, and the door opens, and you don't help them, uh, you know, you're, you're still sinning. And so we were, we were dead because we sinned and we transgressed and we were children of Adam. And in verse two, it says, in which, in, in that state, you walked according to the ways of this world. Now we struggle with the translation of that. And the, and the reason we struggle with the translation of that is it's a, a, it's a, it's a challenging Greek phrase to put into English in a way that we can really understand it. Um, most of you know Greek sort of well enough to know that the Greek word cosmos, cosmos means world. Okay, so the, the waves of the world, um, got it, cosmos, no problem. But the word waves in the Greek is aeon. And if you, you know, if you, if you understand aeon, like when it says that the, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, you know, that the, um, the devil is the god of this aeon, of this age. And aeon is almost always translated age. But the, but there's a depth to the word aeon that is rarely understood because the, it's, it's not just the age, the physical age, the physical time period, but the, the word aeon in Greek was the character within the age, the, the way the devil would mold the age to have certain characteristics. And the, the best example I could give of this is, for example, in the food industry. When um, <laughs> Sean and I, it was kind of funny. We, we seem to have done a lot of Chinese restaurants on this last tour. I don't know how we ended up in so many Chinese restaurants. But, you know, you, we, you go into a Chinese restaurant and they have, they have fish tanks and they have dragons and they have pagodas and they have uh, the Chinese lantern things. And if, if somebody took you blindfolded and then just took the blindfold off inside a Chinese restaurant, if it was a really nice one, you might say, wow, you know, um, somehow or other you got me to China. Or if you went inside a Mexican restaurant, the, the point that, is, that the restaurant's trying to do is it's trying to create an atmosphere so that there's a way of thinking. And that is one of the uh, part of the understanding of the Greek word aeon. And that's why it's translated the ways of the world. That what the devil does, and, and you know, and he, he does this on a regular basis, and he's constantly shifting, he must be meeting with his little helper demons, and he's He's changing the atmosphere, and he'll, he'll shift it. Uh, you know, so for example, in my lifetime, the atmosphere concerning homosexuality has completely changed. Um, that kind of thing. He's, he, he's constantly shifting the atmosphere. And one of the things that we have to be aware of is that when we walk out into the world, that's the devil's aeon. That's his atmosphere. And one of the things that he's going to do, he's going to create an atmosphere where 
dedication to God stands out like a sore thumb. Somebody that's really dedicated to God seems weird. I mean, when you th I mean, even when you think about it, that's just so strange. I mean, you know, you take a breath. Why can you do that? Because God created us that way, and God created air, and God loved us, and we should be thankful for every breath we take. We should be able thankful for every bite of food we eat. We should be able to be thankful to God for every good night's sleep we have. You know, I'm, I'm astounded you go into restaurants. It's so rare that you see people pray before they eat, and yet bite of food comes from God. That it's it's like God doesn't exist, or somehow or other it's it's strange to recognize God in what we do. And that's that's something um if you saw the movie The Matrix, when some when people were in the Matrix, they didn't know it. And that's what the adversary tries to create. He tries to create a matrix around us where people are just comfortable not reading their Bible. They're comfortable not praying before they eat. They're comfortable not giving thanks to God. They're comfortable, you know, uh, not, not sharing their faith or talking about God. And, and that's exactly the the... That's the atmosphere. It's like walking into a Chinese restaurant or walking into a Mexican restaurant. He's created this, uh, this atmosphere where God doesn't exist. You just go walking into the restaurant and there's no God anywhere. And it just becomes comfortable to live like there's no God anywhere. And we really need to break that atmosphere. And Jesus was... Uh, was pretty clear about this. Let's go to um, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. And in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30, uh, Christ is, is speaking, and very clearly he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. You know, that it, <laughs> we talk about sitting on the fence. <laughs> Newsflash, there's no fence. <laughs> there just is simply no fence. It doesn't exist. And you say, well, and, and let's, just, let's just tease this apart a little bit. When he says, whoever is not with me is against me. And somebody stands up and says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, okay, yeah, I'm not with you. But I'm not against you. Really? You know, of course they're against him. Because by not being with him, they're part of the devil's atmosphere that God doesn't exist. They're just one more person in the restaurant who's not praying. They're just one more person who's never thanking God for the air they breathe or the good night's sleep they have. They're just one more person who the devil is using as a pawn to set up his little Mexican restaurant so we can walk in and we can, we can live in the world and God doesn't exist. And they say, I'm not against Christ. Sure you are. You don't know you are. The devil's using you. But the fact is, you're against Christ because you are part of the aeon. You're part of the atmosphere that says it's okay not to be saved. It's okay not to be a committed Christian. It's okay not to pray. It's okay not to read your Bible. And when people see you, then they go, oh, well, he doesn't read his Bible. He doesn't pray. It must be okay. And that's and they're they're part of the atmosphere, and that's what the adversary does. He sets up that atmosphere. Look at uh, Romans chapter twelve. In Romans chapter twelve, we see the same kind of thing in verse two. We can just pick it up in verse one. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as lit as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. Well, there's okay. There's. <laughs> There's God's atmosphere. Our bodies are living sacrifices. They're holy. They're pleasing to God. And furthermore, that's a reasonable service. Verse 2, and don't be conformed to the pattern of this age, this atmosphere. You know, don't, 
because this the atmosphere has a pattern in the pattern you just just imagine yourself walking into a Mexican restaurant, but the instead of being Mexican restaurant on the front, it's called God Doesn't Exist Restaurant. And that's where we live. We live in God Doesn't Exist Restaurant and all of the stuff around us. God doesn't exist. And it's part of the, the aeon. And what does this was the scripture say? Don't be conformed to that pattern. Don't be like in the matrix where people didn't even know they were in the matrix. Don't be conformed to that pattern, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind or the bringing of your mind up, the, the kinosis, the new quality of your mind, so that you can attest and approve what the will of God is. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to walk according to the ways of, uh, we don't want to walk according to the ways of in God's world. And then it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, according to the ruler of the authority of the air. And that's an interesting phrase because it can be taken two different ways. Because authority there can be used of direct authority in exousia, or it can be used by metonymy for those that hold authority. So in talking about the ruler of the authority of the air, it's talking about the devil, and the devil has authority that he exercises, but it also means that the devil has rulership over the demons who exercise authority, and both of those things are true, and, and um, what, are, what, are, what are those demons doing, and what is the devil doing? Well, they're creating the atmosphere. That's the, uh, the ways of the world, the aeon of the cosmos, the atmosphere that's in the world around us. And then it says the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. And again, there's, there's only two classes of people, obedient people and disobedient people. So he says these, these guys are working in the people who are disobedient. And then uh, verse, uh, verse 3 among whom we also once lived. So uh, back to kind of our 10,000 foot view, our, our macro view. So we were dead because of transgressions and sins. And worse, we lived in the there is no God restaurant and thought it was fine that there wasn't any God. And, and we're under uh, the influence of the, the devil and his demons, and he was at work in us because we were disobedient. And furthermore, when we lived in, in the No God restaurant, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And if we're, if uh, I contend that if we're going to be committed Christians, one of the things that we need to be aware of is that our flesh has desires. So your, your flesh, my flesh has a desire for Oreo cookies. <laughs> Which I just, you know, but, but the, the desi a desire of flesh can be overeating, it can be oversleeping, it can be I hate exercise, it can be whatever the heck it is. But the flesh has desires. And if we're not honest about that, then, then we, we don't make war against that. Now, we're never going to be perfect, but we do have to, to, to bring our thoughts under control, and we do have to use our minds to control our bodies. And I'm sure you guys remember Galatians 5.16, but let's just take a quick look at it just to remind ourselves of what Galatians said. In Galatians 5, right before the uh, fruit of the Spirit section, um, in Galatians 5, 16, it says, Now I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will absolutely not gratify the desires of the flesh. And uh, the word, when it says desires of the flesh, it can refer to the sin nature as well. But also the flesh itself has desires. Uh, verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other with the result that you're not doing what you want. And that's true. Because our flesh has desires, we are not as good at doing 
the things that we know to do as we should be. But if we, and, and like I say, we're, we're never gonna, we're never gonna be 100% on this. We're never gonna beat the flesh completely. Um, but what we do know is that if, at least if we understand that's the fight, then, then we can in, enter into it with our head on our shoulders saying, okay, here's the fight. This is what I'm going to run into. And I, I, I need to figure out how to, to beat my flesh. And by the way, just uh, one, of the, one of the best ways to beat your flesh is habit. When you, when you find something that's really good to do, just make a habit of it. It's a lot easier to continually do something that, that you've made into a habit than something that you have to tell yourself to do every day. So back to Ephesians. Um, so we, there, we were carrying out the desires of the flesh. We were by children, the nature of rest, just as the rest. So if we, if we back up here and get a look at how, uh, you know, from God's point of view, uh, how much help we needed, then without explanation, it's just, and you, when you were dead, due to your transgressions and sins, in which you once walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the authority air, the spirit who is now at work, and those who were disobedient, among whom we also all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just like the rest. And that's how bad we were. And now the subject completely shifts and starts with the, 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 the uh, but, verse 4, but God. And remember that now in the Greek, it's one sentence. We made it into a, a second sentence in English, but, but uh, in Greek, it, it's just continuing the same sentence. So in the middle of the sentence, but God. <laughs> you know, here comes the guy on the white horse. He's going to save us. He's going to rescue us being rich in mercy, and that's what we needed. We, we needed mercy. We needed the withholding of merited judgment. Yeah, we needed grace, but the emphasis here, because of our sins and transgressions, our emphasis here is mercy. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And in, uh, in, the, in the prophecy tonight, God said, you are my little children. I've got children. I, I love them. I know the natural love that parents have for children. And God, we are his children. And then there was a, a prophecy, so I can show you how much I love you, talking about the ages to come. So then in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, even when we were dead, due to our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And then here's the insertion of grace. By grace, you have been saved. Uh, and then he raised us up with him, with Christ, seated us with him, with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jeff did a good job last week, uh, last week of talking about the idiom of the prophetic perfect and showing how obviously we're not in heaven now, we're on earth. This is an, an idiomatic placement of us in heaven because of the rapture. And then verse 7, so that in the ages to come, he could show us the immeasurable riches of his grace by his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And when I think of the ages to come, you know, I, I think right away of um, even the, the age to come that the tribulation is in. Because you know, when it talks about God and he's going to show us the immeasurable riches of his grace by his kindness, you know, and we get raptured and we're looking down and the world is <laughs> literally going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, people dying everywhere. It's a, it's a, the, the whole world is a complete mess. We look down and realize that we've been pulled out of that because we're God's children by birth, you know, right away. I mean, right with the rapture, we're going to start understanding the immeasurable riches of God's grace. And then verse 8, 
for by grace you have been saved through trust. And I know that uh, last Thursday there was a, quite a discussion on this. I thought Jeff did a really good job with it. Our trust does not save us. Um, you can't just trust yourself into living forever. But the tr our trust is the is the necessary condition for God to save us. So what gives us our everlasting life is God's grace, the, what sets up the conditions so we can receive that grace is our trust. So both things are needed. We need to have the trust, the necessary condition. God needs to provide the grace which saves us. For by grace you've been saved through trust, and it's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, and that's exactly correct. If we had to buy everlasting life, I mean, what if what if you could buy a year for a penny? I mean, even, even if, you know, maybe, um, you know, you could live a couple million years, and then it would, <laughs> and God would come, and you get a little ticket, it'd be like, your time is running out, hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> You know, it's like, wait, wait. I mean, we we need God to provide us everlasting life. Absolutely. And it's not a result of works. We can't work for it so nobody could boast. And then verse 10, for we're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, in union with Christ Jesus, and then to do good works. And again, uh, a great verse to meditate on and think about that we've been created to do good good works and every every one of us is unique i had an opportunity of uh, talking to a young lady on this last tour and she was feeling like she was just like everybody else you know i'm oh i'm just like everybody else and i've, I've got you know yes i'm this way and i'm that way and i said I said, okay, imagine a, a palette, a painter's palette here. And I said, okay, what would you say your primary ministry is? And she told me what it was. And I said, okay, let's call that blue. And I just, you know, I mean, I've only got my hand, so I'm just doing like this. Okay, we make a spot of this, this uh, painter's palette in the blue. And I said, so what are some of your other strengths in ministries? Well, I kind of do this. Oh, okay. How would you say that's really like strong? Yeah, okay, that's going to be red. And and so as we kind of pretend painted a palette, as she kept saying things that were that where she felt she was really strong and she felt she could really contribute, it was pretty obvious that what was happening was she was painting a really unique palette that nobody else had. And I said, I said to her, that's that's who you are. You are God's gift. No one else has that exact palette. You are not replaceable. And, and we've got to believe that. We're not replaceable and we are unique. And we were created to do good works, but the good works that I do are going to be totally different than the good works that you do. And they're going to be different than the good works that your neighbor does. And it's worth just kind of thinking and, and reflecting on how we how unique we are and then the boldest i mean i just have to credit john so much that he just gets the thought he need to go to kenya and do mission work it's like right and and he doesn't i would have said lord i don't have any money i don't know anybody in kenya i don't like long play. you know i mean you can make a giant list of excuses and john's like okay I'll go to Kenya. And the next thing you know, he's got people, he's got places to stay, he's got congregations to preach to. It's it's absolutely astounding. And you know, if we if we walk out and and just trust God, God, look at this palette that I am. Look how unique I am. You have something you want me to do. And then we do exactly what Romans 12 2 says. It says, well, back there, it said that we might test and approve. Because you might think that you're supposed to do something and then you begin to test it and dabble in it and you find out, yeah, I don't really like this. And that's not what you were supposed to be doing. And, and you keep poking around until there's, until there's a fit, until we find out what we want to do. So this is, this is kind of, this is what I wanted to share tonight. 
and, and, and especially that we understand that there's no fence. We're, people are either for Christ or against Christ. And we can help them understand that so they're not so comfortable thinking they're neutral. Well, I'm not against him. Yeah, you are. And you need to know that. And I hope it makes you uncomfortable and maybe it'll change. We, and we need to be good at, at explaining that and helping people understand that and how much we needed God and how God saved us and how the world is like a restaurant and the sign on that restaurant it isn't Chinese, it isn't Mexican, it's God doesn't exist restaurant. And we can't be comfortable eating in that restaurant. And God bless you and the floor is wide open for discussion or whatever we want to do.